This story has been recorded at an Addictive Eaters Anonymous meeting in the UK. You can email us at contact at aeainfo.org. My name is Pamela and I am an addictive eater. Um, it's funny, when I'm asked to remember how I used to eat, binge eat, I do struggle with trying to remember that misery. I really do. But what I do remember most are my feelings. It's funny, isn't it? From a very, very young age, inadequate, fat, thick, never enough, ill at ease, stupid, and spoilt. <laughs> I felt all of those emotions from a young kid, you know. Um, and I grew up in a household where children were to be seen but not heard. And I never knew how to express what it was I wanted. I always felt ashamed and guilty. And I just remember from a very, very, very young age, going into the larder, the pantry, in my, my mother and father's house, and just stuffing my face. Anything I could put my hands on. Bottles of stout, my father's heart tablets, painkillers, and food. I was unable, if I saw mounds of food, and in our house, food was plentiful. You know, my parents weren't short of cash, and they'd come from a different country and a different continent, and they believed in that your children shouldn't go hungry. And every bowl, every cupboard, every cooking pot was always loaded with food. And my parents just entertained all the time with food. Um, you could never leave food on your plate. And every guest who came to the house had to eat something. Otherwise, my mother would be offended. It's just our culture. So to abuse food and to eat food in great amounts was seen as funny and it almost expected really. So it was easy that when I felt ill at ease with the world, it was easy to just eat. And I know I was full of rage. I hated my mother. I thought I hated my mother as a young child. She was a real matriarch, a real pillar of the community, and everybody came to ask her for advice, you know, a very strong woman. And um, so I just pushed my feelings down with great mounds of food. And when my parents didn't have any money, she, we used to have pilchards and white rice. <laughs> My sister and I, when we were stuck in the kitchen, used to do all sorts of things with that food so we didn't have to eat the pilchards and rice. But put anything else in front of us, you know, fish and chips on a Friday, um, Caribbean food over the weekend, uh, Caribbean buns and, and uh, all sorts of, you know, coconut cakes and, oh boy, um, what the Scottish call uh, mint tablets. You know, the Caribbeans made mint tablets as well. And, you know, the, the, the whole house was a treasure trove of, of food, which I easily ate great mounds of. And I remember that when I used to go to bed at night, I used to say to my sister, I've taken my dad's pills and I've washed it down with stout. And my sister would laugh. My sister had this illness as well. And my sister would eat throughout the night. She would get up and eat. I was too lazy to get up and eat at night. I just ate throughout the whole day, you know. Uh, bags of sugar. Um, there was a local shop around the corner. I used to steal. I used to go into the shop. And when, when the, the old man, 
uh, and I remember his name, his back was turned, I would steal the penny chews from the counter. So I would order a mix up for 10p and then when his back was turned, I'd grab a load. I would go home, I'd offer a sweet, I'd always be polite and offer a sweet to everybody. And then I would just go upstairs into the bedroom with my great big bag of sweets and eat them into oblivion. I was a sad little child, you know. And I remember all never being enough. And at a young age, deciding, I remember thinking, if I can't win, I'm not going to play. And I wouldn't join in games. I wouldn't go out with the local kids because I knew that if I did not win at the games that they were playing, I would be so full of rage. So I would sit home and eat. You know, and I would eat crisps and chips and sweeties and anything I could get my hands on. And, you know, there were a lot of fried foods, fried fishes, fried dumplings, roasted dumplings, lashings of butter, lard. I used to eat brown sauce on toast, red sauce on toast, all sorts of strange combinations, you know, as a young child, just to take away the feelings inside of me. So I grew up, I started my job, and of course the illness came with me. Um, you know, it just got worse and worse. As a child at school, I was called Big Bomb Barrel. That was my name. And the boys at school would follow me around shouting Big Bomb Barrel, Big Bomb Barrel. Barrel's not my real name. They would call me my real name, Big Bomb Barrel just chanting and it was embarrassing but I couldn't stop it didn't matter that they were laughing at me it didn't matter that I was in tears it didn't matter that my girlfriends used to say but you're so pretty if only you could lose 10 stones because <laughs> by this time you know I grew to 20 odd stones you know I couldn't stop eating and it didn't matter that people were trying to shame me you know, family were trying to shame me. They thought they were helping me, but it just made me worse, you know. Just hid more and ate more. Um, and then the exercise started. And I have a joke that I just exercise myself fat because I just can't control the eating. And, you know, if you listen to nutritionalists and, and dietitians, they'll say, eat less, move more. Well, how do you do that when you realize that you can't, you can't stop eating? No diets. I did all the diets, all the famous diets, all the slimming clubs that people know of. I went there. I went for one or two weeks and I just left because I just knew I couldn't stop. Um, started my job. I was in a public office did a public service, you know, and it doesn't take much for the public to find your weak spot and call you a fat so-and-so. And, but I couldn't stop. It doesn't matter. It did not matter that other people were shaming me, calling me in public. My colleagues were refusing to work with me. I remember when I did stop eating, one of my colleagues said to me, I used to get so frustrated when we were at night duty because we'd have to visit the 24 hour garage 10 times so you could have your uh, lollies and your chocolates and your crisps. He said, I just wanted to scream, for God's sake, just get them all at once. I know you're going to eat them throughout the whole night. Just get the whole bag at the start. But what he wouldn't have known if I'd have got the whole bag at the start, I'd have just eaten them at the start. You know, at least this way I was pacing it out and going every hour or every two hours as opposed to getting a carrier bag full and doing a carrier bag full every hour, you know, because I was, I was a bottomless pit. I could not stop and it didn't matter. I just don't remember a time when I ever had a moderate sensible meal. I, I, don't, I don't know what that looks like. So, you know, um... Suffice to say, one day I was in my apartment, I looked out the window and I thought there's got to be more to life than this. 
And I remember praying and saying to God, you know, kill me or cure me, but there's got to be more to life than this. So in about 1993, I think I, I came to my first meeting, I found the fellowship, I walked into the rooms, and for the first time in my life, people weren't telling me to go on a diet. They said that it was an illness, that it was an addiction, and without outside help and without a power greater than myself, it was impossible to stop. And I knew that that was true for me, you know. The people smiled, they nodded, they understood what I was talking about. That no matter how low I felt, how depressed I got, I couldn't stop eating. No matter how um, people laughed at me, I couldn't stop eating. And they said, it's fine, it's an illness, and we can help you. Um, so I came into the fellowship when I was 29. And for the first three years, I was able to eat three meals a day, a day at a time, and lose weight. And I went from 20, almost 26 stones, down to 12 or 13 stones. But do you know, I knew in my heart that the illness was, it was just at bay. It, it hadn't really gone. I hadn't totally surrendered my own idea of what to eat and when to eat. I still had this fantasy about food and, and what I was going to have that evening, even though I was losing weight. And it took another 15 years of that torture still yo-yo, up and down, never quite back to 26 stones, but the torture in the head was just as bad. Until in 2008, I met a woman who is still my sponsor today. And she talked about total surrender. She talked about being unable to choose what types of food to eat and when to eat. She talked about allowing somebody else to take away the food obsession, the weight obsession, and the exercise obsession by asking for help from another member of Addictive Eaters Anonymous. And that made sense to me. I knew there was going to come a time when I said, I give up. I can't do this anymore. If you tell me, to, I said this to my sponsor, if you tell me to have three dishes of sprouts a day for my breakfast, my lunch and my dinner, I'll do it because I can't manage food. Um, I've tried, I've tried every diet, I've tried every combination, I've tried every trick and it doesn't work. So please tell me what to do. And she said to me, are you willing to go to any lengths? And I said, absolutely. And so today, I'm pleased to say that that obsession and that the weight has gone, most definitely, but it's the freedom from the head, freedom from the thinking about food, fantasizing about food, planning food, and, you know, freedom from going to the cinema and, and not salivating over what other people are eating or being or watching what other people are eating, you know, freedom from that hold that eating the first one can have on my physical body, you know. It's gone and it's miraculous. And all I've had to do is ask for help from another member. Find a sponsor, someone to work with on a daily basis and be prepared to change. I had to change my whole life because I recognise that food is not my problem. There's something about me that when restless, irritable, discontented, depressed, anxious, any of those adjectives, or even happy or elated, you know? There's just something about me that wants to numb out of life. And when I eat or drink the first one or start this awful cycle of taking other substances, I can't stop. So I've had to rely on a power greater than myself, a sponsor, and other people 
who are sober and can help me with my problems and help me to change. And the 12 steps is all about changing from an inside out job and finding a power greater than myself that I can turn to in times of um, excitement, happiness, joy, or depression, you know. Um, this program's taught me to help others, to forget about me, and to realize there are no problems that can't be solved, you know, one day at a time within the 24 hours, and that my head is a liar. My head will tell me to worry. My head will tell me that other people don't like me. And this program has taught me to not listen to my head. It has taught me to read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, to get an understanding of the illness, to work with another uh, addictive eater who's more sober than myself, to tell myself how to be really honest, how to talk about those feelings that do pop up every now and again, you know, but not to take them seriously and to just go and help somebody else. And the joy that brings, you know, of meeting newcomers who are as desperate as me um, and want that help. So I'm pleased to say that it's been a pleasure to um, come through that journey, come to the other end of it, and a day at a time just get better and better, you know. It's a way of life for me. Um, I intend to keep coming back for the rest of my life. I won't even pretend and say a day at a time. It is, it is for the rest of my life, by the will of God. Thanks for listening.